So after my video on buying fish, I got a lot of questions about pollutants in fish. You know, mercury, PCBs, and all those other things you hear about in the media that make you worried about eating fish. So today, I have a very special guest who is going to help us understand the pros and cons of eating fish. Dr. Kendra Yard is a professor with the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research at the University of Windsor in Ontario, Canada. He has consulted with the Ontario government to streamline the Fish Consumption Advisory Program. He's also been involved in international programs in the Caribbean, Dubai, and China. Dr. Driard has published over 130 research papers in environmental sciences and is an associated editor with the Journal Bulletin of Environmental Contamination and Toxicology. And I still can't believe my luck that he is sitting right here in my kitchen right now. Dr. Driard, welcome to the show. Well, it's great to be here. <laughs> and part of the pleasure of talking with you on your show is also getting to eat your wonderful cooking. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's coming to class tonight. And it's a fish class. So as you can see, scientists who study pollutants and fish still eat fish. We love fish. <laughs> so what are some risks of eating fish? What pollutants do we need to take into account when deciding which fish to eat and how much of it to eat? They're both. PCBs and mercury have potential problems in terms of causing neurological deficits. Uh, at very high doses in adults, they will cause neurological problems. And for women who are of childbearing age and who, who may have children, there is a potential problem at high doses of mercury or PCBs that their children can be born with neurological deficits. That's probably the biggest issue with that. The third contaminant is dioxins and furans, and they are uh, potentially cancer promoters. So the most famous disastrous consequence of eating high mercury fish is the Minamata disaster in Japan, when very large quantities of mercury were spilled into the water, and then people ate that fish and ended up with all sorts of neurological damage, birth defects, etc. How does that level compare to the levels of mercury that we see in fish today in the first world, you know, in US, Canada, Europe, um, even when we look at high mercury fish, like say swordfish? So the estimates in, in Minamata disease that uh, people were consuming fish with anywhere between 10 and 50 part per million of total mercury. Now, if we compare the, the, the highest concentrations of, of fish, let's say uh, the uh, Gulf of Mexico tilefish, mm -hmm. the concentrations are about one part per million. So between 10 and 50 times lower than what was causing Minamata disease. So let's go through the fish that are high in mercury. Out of the fish that are commonly available to us in the stores and restaurants, which ones are considered to be high. The classic case is the Gulf of Mexico tile fish, mm -hmm. upwards of around one microgram of, uh, per gram of total mercury. Uh, many species of shark will start to approach that value, as well as the larger species of tuna, such as big eye tuna and bluefin tuna. So since not all of our viewers might be familiar with different species of tuna, uh, let's just clarify for them that the tuna most Americans are consuming are skipjack, albacore, and yellowfin. Yellowfin also goes under the name of ahi tuna, and uh, those are not high mercury tunas. The two that you mentioned that are high in mercury are big eye and bluefin, and unfortunately, almost all of them go to Japan. And I guess I say unfortunately because they are so delicious. But in Boston, we're a great fish city, and I see almost no big eye or bluefin tuna in the stores. In restaurants, I do see them on occasion, usually at exorbitant prices, and served in tiny, tiny portions. So there is probably no huge risk of most people getting too much mercury by eating too much big eye or bluefin tuna, right? <laughs> That's exactly correct. Uh, so uh, of those three species, the skipjack and the yellowfin and albacore, mm -hmm. 
the skipjack typically has the lowest concentrations. Mm -hmm. It's also one of the smaller fish species mm -hmm. of, of the three, and it is more commonly present in uh, canned tuna. So when it's labeled light tuna, most times it will be skipjack tuna. Oh, okay. It has the lowest concentrations. The uh, albacore and the yellowfin have about twice the amount of mercury in it and uh, the number of recommended meals are a little bit less. But even for the sensitive population, this is women of childbearing age and children under the age of 15, we're looking at meal advice somewhere between three and four meals per week. And that's an eight ounce serving as one meal. So that's still quite a bit. Okay. If you're the general population, uh, those species are essentially unlimited. We mentioned tilefish and big tunas. Are there any other high mercury fish that people need to take into account? Well, many species of shark mm -hmm. are high in, in mercury, mm -hmm. as well as swordfish. Uh -huh. So shark, swordfish, marlin? Blue marlin as well, yes. And marlin, okay. So now we got that out there. If you're concerned about mercury, maybe try to avoid those species. So if you're avoiding high mercury fish, how many times a week would you think it's okay for people to eat fish? For the general population, the, the recommendation could be as high as eating fish every day. What about young children and women of childbearing age? So they need to be a little bit more careful. Um, and again, it really depends on which species that they're, they're consuming. Uh, but for a majority of them, they should probably be limiting between three to one and a half meals per week. But again, we're talking a meal as about eight ounces of eight fish, ounces. which is a pretty large amount of fish. And I think of a, you know, a can of tuna is four ounces. Four ounces. So yeah. two cans of tuna represents a meal. So I'm guessing for an average person, the conclusion is eat more fish rather than eat less fish, because I doubt an average person in the US is eating fish three times a week. And the cardiac benefits mm -hmm. for cardiac health uh, at least according to a 2007 JAMA paper, mm -hmm. suggests that those health benefits probably outweigh the costs when we're talking what is available commercially for the general population. In that article, for example, they were comparing uh, cancer risk related to dioxins in salmon. Mm -hmm. And they contrasted that to the health benefits for reducing uh, cardiac disease. Mm -hmm. And they suggested that the the benefit to risk ratio was about 100 to 300. So in other words, there would be 100 to 300 more people who would benefit from uh, cardiac uh, health outcomes by eating more fish mm -hmm. compared to the uh, three or four people who may have excess can cancers above the population norm. Just to clarify, the accents and mercury are separate issues, uh, separate pollutants. Are dioxins an issue for all fish or some specific fish that are particularly high in dioxins? So dioxins and furans and PCBs are really a, a more localized issue. Mm -hmm. So for certain freshwater bodies like the Laurentian Great Lakes, you'll find more PCBs. Mm -hmm. uh, in certain areas that had a lot of historical industrial activity like the Hudson River, for example, they will have PCBs and dioxins. Mm -hmm. PCBs and dioxins were, of course, one of the issues related to uh, warnings about the consumption of farmed salmon mm -hmm. that occurred earlier in the 2000s. When I googled farm-raised salmon PCBs, um, most of the advice that I got on websites like Mayo Clinic was suggesting eating very low amounts of farm-raised salmon, something like a once every two months, and their portion size was four ounces. So that's tiny um, because of the PCB concern. Um, is that really a problem? So that was a very big study in 2004. It was published in Science Magazine, which is one of the most prestigious scientific journal. And it was a very comprehensive uh, survey. So uh, Ron Heights, the lead author, they had sampled over 700 fish representing uh, commercial fish from all across the world. And one of their big findings was that farm salmon had higher PCBs and dioxins compared to 
wild salmon. To some extent, when we looked at the PCB concentrations, they, weren't, they still weren't that high, even though they were higher than the wild salmon. But the dioxins was a bit of an issue, and it was sort of approaching this uh, three uh, part per billion TEQ value, which is very close to a threshold. The good news is the salmon industry responded to this. And uh, one of the sources of the dioxins in the PCBs came from the, the, the commercial pellets that they were feeding the fish. W when they were originally feeding the fish, they are basically collecting marine-derived small fish species and compressing them into pellets. But they are also concentrating the fats from those marine-derived species, and that's where the PCBs and dioxins tend to be stored. By collecting these small fish species and concentrating their fats in the food, they were concentrating chemicals in the food that were fed to these fish. Mm -hmm. Now one of the changes that were made because of the controversy surrounding farm salmon was to supplement the oils or the fats that were present in the food with vegetable oils. And that has led to some dramatic decline. So almost a fourfold decline in dioxin levels in salmons from 1999 to present. So now that the dioxins in farm-raised salmon have declined by four times, how would you weigh the pros and cons of eating farm-raised salmon? Uh, because when I uh, tried to look up the amount of mercury in farmed salmon, it's one of the lowest mercury fish. I mean, I mean swordfish has 50 times the amount of mercury that farm-raised salmon has. Um, so, and it's very high in omega-3, so there are lots of benefits there. Um, are there any downsides? would you cap the amount of farm-raised salmon that people should consider eating? I think you can eat a lot of farm salmon. Um, now there is, there's some interesting consequences that come with changing the source of fats added to the foods. And this is changing the composition of fats in farm salmon slightly compared to their wild co counterparts. So we now find that the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is depleted in the farm salmon compared to their wild analogs. And that was sort of one of the big benefits from a, from a cardiac health indicator. Mm -hmm. So in some respects, we've, we've dropped contaminants down, but we've also slightly decreased the nutritional aspect of farm salmon. But I don't think this is anything to be um, highly worried about and because farm salmon has much more fat content than uh, the wild salmon you also have an absolutely higher amount of uh, omega-3s that you're ingesting mm -hmm. so it's it's really hard and I don't think the nutritional literature really knows that balance mm -hmm. between the ratio of omega-3s to 6s that is optimal for cardiac health or is it do you just need to get enough omega-3s into your diet oh, so it's a okay. bit of an open-ended question uh -huh. But I think we can safely say, at least from the perspective of dioxins and PCBs, that farm-raised salmon is uh, something that's highly edible. So for mercury, it is the children and women of childbearing age who are at biggest risk. Uh, what about PCBs and dioxins? Are they a problem for all population or specific subsets of people? So there's. There's That's two right. types of PCBs. Uh, two types of PCBs. <laughs> oh, okay. So there are PCBs that have dioxin-like activity. And when we're computing the dioxin concentration, we also incorporate those specific congeners of PCBs into that calculation. And then there are other PCBs that are non-dioxin-like. And those are the dominant uh, forms of PCBs that are present in total PCBs. And those total PCBs have uh, mostly neurological issues, uh, neurological problems, much like mercury. So I, I can provide some feedback from how uh, the province of Ontario deals with this. So uh, for the province of Ontario, they have separate uh, health guideline triggers for mercury for the sensitive subpopulation and for the general population. For PCBs and dioxins, they use the same trigger values. So essentially, very similar advice, but they ask that when you get to less than four meals per month as a, as a consumption warning that 
women of childbearing age uh, refrain from eating that species of fish. So does salmon have high PCBs, farmer salmon? The moment salmon does not, does unless not. it unless it's oh. salmon that is collected from Lake Michigan. Oh, okay. <laughs> As a society, we would like to reach a condition of essentially unlimited consumption of fish and not be worried about any contaminants present. Uh, we do have certain pollutants that are globally persistent uh, throughout the environment, uh, and there are initiatives out there to try and reduce those concentrations and we're doing a good job so uh, there's been uh, basically the Minimatic Convention signed by hundreds of countries to reduce mercury emissions on a global basis. PCBs are regulated under the Stockholm Convention again hundreds of countries are trying to engage in virtual elimination of the uh, a whole set of different compounds so we're doing good uh, but you know we're still in a recovery phase of phasing those chemicals out. But for the most part, the concentrations of those chemicals, except for these few exceptional fish, are, uh, tend to be low enough that we can consume without too much worry. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Any other misconceptions people have about the risks of eating fish? Well, I think that the best thing to do is to educate yourself. Um, and look for some of the online resources. So hopefully you'll put some of these resources, for example, the FDA and EPA's mercury uh, information pages, guides to eating fish. Mm -hmm. And if you're a sport fisher or an angler, then almost every state and province uh, basically has uh, their own sport fish advisory program. And they will provide you uh, information about each water body that you might be fishing at, the types of fish species that you can catch, and what you can safely consume. So again, I'd, I'd hope people would sort of educate themselves. And the worst thing that we want, or the worst outcome, is that people avoid fish because they're afraid of the contaminants. Mm -hmm. I think being uh, understanding what fish to basically target and what fish to avoid can basically help you achieve a healthy lifestyle, a healthy diet, and hopefully a great tasting diet. Dr. Driard, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for answering all of our questions and clearing up some pretty big misconceptions that we get from popular media. My pleasure. <laughs> if you have any follow-up questions for Dr. Driard or me about mercury and fish, toxins, PCBs, leave us a comment and we'll do our best to get you information. Here are some more thought-provoking culinary videos for you to check out. And if you are ever in the Boston area, maybe I'll see you in one of my classes.